Are you blessed and highly favored? <laughs> Isn't worship wonderful? I'm telling you, man. It's amazing to me how people cannot, just don't want to worship God. <laughs> Glory. Well, you know what? I have some realities tonight. In fact, there's eight realities that we must maintain. And we're going to talk about eight. Now, eight is the number of new beginning. Seven is complete. Six means man. But there are realities that you and I must maintain. I mean, there's many of them, but there's eight specific ones that the Spirit is releasing to us right now. Would you turn to John chapter 1? Hallelujah. <laughs> Dear God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for interpreting my writing. <laughs> the shorthand, it's, it's, uh, it's a Holy Ghost shorthand. Only he can interpret it. John 1.1, 1, 1, let's speak it together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the light, life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and darkness did not comprehend the light. The first reality here is that is the reality of life. In other words, life and its existence. There is a reality that you and I must maintain that there is life. Regardless of what there is, where, whatever, what kind of condition an individual is, it's still life and existing life. In other words, existing in this realm, existence itself. There must be a reality all the time. Whatever form of life there is, it is existence. This is a reality that there's a life. And God desires that no one be left behind. Amen? So the first reality here is Life and its existence. There must be, it must be constant no matter what. And let's go a little further <clears throat> in verse 6. And of course here, the other reality is that in him was, and light shines in the darkness, and darkness doesn't what? Comprehend it. So there's no comprehension in, of an individual that's in darkness, only if they're in what? The light. And that is the life of God. In verse 6 it says here, There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and this man was for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. In other words, the light was association with the light of life as a creator. He was not the light, but was sent to what? Bear witness of the light that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Okay, so in this second reality, there's always a source of something. In other words, there's an original. There's a beginning. Everything that you and I look at, there's an original. There's a beginning. And it's coming from a creator. So again, there is a, a constant reality of existence in life. And there's a constant reality. There's an originator of, or be someone who has started this whole thing. Amen? So when people try to say, well, there is no God, it's because they got no reality at all. They got no reality of life. 
They believed that something could just come from nothing. No, somebody created it. Amen? So in this reality, there's always a source, original, a beginning. And he said, and, and this light is of the creation of life. He is called the creator. Amen? So the second reality is there is a source of all existence. There's a source behind it. There's an originator. There was someone that's created it. Is everybody with me? Go to Genesis chapter 1. Hallelujah. Let's start at verse 1. In the beginning was, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because he's the what? Originator. He's the creator. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be what? Light. And there was light. Why? Because he's the originator of all things. <clears throat> And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. God called the light day, and darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters, which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into the one place and let dry land appear. And so it was. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass the herbs that yield seeds and the fruit tree and that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb that yield seeds according to its kind and tree that yield fruits, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So even in morning were the third day, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and so it was then god made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also so god set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great seas, sea creatures, and, and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply. And fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So in the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Cattle and crimping things and beasts of the earth and each according to its kind. And so it was. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over everything that we've created, <laughs> the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over every birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
And God said, See, I have given you herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the, all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be food. Also for every, every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And so it was. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we see here, here is a reality that God is the source behind all things. There is a creator, no matter what anyone says. Amen. Go to Second Peter chapter 3. He is the creator of all things in existence. It's all a part of the second reality. First reality is of life and its existence. Second reality is there's a source behind all existence, and is, that is God, creator. And these are things that we must maintain. Because one of the things the enemy tries to do is put things out of order and put us first. You know, if we realize that God is true and there all the time, he sees all, knows all. Amen? People's lives would be different. But they begin to drift. They become carnal again. They begin to be focused on themselves. But these are things that you and I must maintain all the time. And 2 Peter chapter 3. And verse 1. 2 Peter 3, 1, let's read it together. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers would come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to what? Repentance. Wow. So the world of old that was destroyed. Amen? He said he was destroyed with the flood. Well, we know something went wrong then. Amen? Because <laughs> God wasn't going to destroy the world with a flood if something that didn't go wrong. We know that the fallen had taken place. And then he says that the new world is reserved for judgment and destruction by fire to the ungodly or the rebellious that refuse to follow the light of creation. All of creation will come to an end of judgment. All of everything comes to judgment. This must be the third reality that nobody gets away with nothing. That there's a judgment for everything and every person of everything that they have done. Of course, unless it's under the blood of repentance. Amen. That's why he says he desires everybody to come under to repentance because it's covered under the blood. Nobody gets away. That must be the third reality, that an end of all, everything will be under the judgment of God, no matter what. Galatians chapter 6. Hallelujah.
in verse 7 and 8, this is still under the third reality, judgment of God. Is everybody there? Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. Let's speak it together. Do not be deceived. God is what? Not mocked. For whatever man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will the Spirit what? Reap life. In other words, the creator of life, a life existence, will not be mocked. By, create, by his own creation, he will not be mocked. Nobody gets away with it. What you sow is what you reap. What you do unto others, you'll be done unto you. Amen? And this is that judgment. And 1 Samuel 15, 22. Hallelujah. First Samuel fifteen twenty two. <clears throat> oh, happy days. Is everybody there? So Samuel the prophet said to Saul, the king, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than what? Sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of the ram. For rebellion is a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he will reject you from holding a position of office. Does everybody understand that? In other words... Third reality, still, judgment. God will judge. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Always, that's so important. Because the enemy always brings you to, oh, I've sacrificed so much, I want to do this and I want to do that. And obedience is better than sacrifice. In other words, God's will and direction is better than our own. People have no idea that they're out of God's will, even though things are going good. In Psalm 51. Is everybody there? Psalm 51, we'll start at verse 5. Let's speak it together. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know Wisdom. In other words, you and I were born in darkness. This must be a reality for me and you. Why? Because of what wrong. That's why God destroyed the first, what we call the first world. Amen. And that's why he's going to destroy the second world because people will still continue in a place of wickedness. They will refuse to follow the light. So the fourth reality is that you and I were born in darkness, but there's something more I want to add to this. Because if we were born in darkness, that means that you and I were born under a ruler of darkness. That's the fourth reality. If we were born in darkness, then we were born under a ruler of darkness. This must be a constant reality that the ruler of the darkness rules this world. Amen? 2 Corinthians 4. Some people still don't have this reality. Second Corinthians four and verse three. It's 
So all, everything that's been created is God's creation. Amen? But so much of God is creation. In the, and even in the Word, it tells us that even the creation of corruption that's laid in corruption now because it's, it's been rebirthed in darkness, it's been taken over and ruled by darkness, is all of this is going to get turned over to those who are the light. And that corruption will cease. But in verse 3 it says, But even if our gospel or our message of truth is veiled, it's blinded, it is veiled to those who are what? Perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So we see here, again, that there, there's a reality that must be understood, that the ruler of darkness blinds creation from the light of life. He, Im he imprisons, he controls, he steals, he kills, he destroys. And that's his job. And he does it very well. And he prevents people from coming to the light or knowing the truth. That's still, that's the fourth reality. That there is a ruler of the world of darkness. Even though that you and I were born in this world of darkness. Amen. There's still a ruler. That's why you must be born again. Amen. Ephesians 6. In verse 10. This is still under the fourth reality of the ruler of the world of darkness. And that we're born in this darkness. These are realities that you and I must maintain. In verse 10, let's speak it together. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the trickery of darkness or of the devil. Amen. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers of the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and hand, having done all, to stand. And this reality continues about the ruler of this earth, the ruler of the world, that we fight an, against an unseen realm. That our fight is unseen because it's darkness. Amen? In other words, what is our, the things that influence us? Of thoughts, emotions, imaginations, desires, lusts. We were born in this war between light and darkness. And we were born in darkness. Now that we've come to the light and been taken out of, the, out of darkness, we battle against that darkness but the darkness is hidden in darkness. Does everybody understand that? <laughs> so you must have the light of Christ to be able to see the darkness. To discern its influence through thought, through emotion, through desires, through imaginations. It's a war and it's constant battle. That's still considered under the fourth Reality that's under the ruler of this dark, the ruler of this world is darkness. In John chapter 1 again, verse 10. John 1 10. Is everybody okay? Let's speak it together. It says that he, the true light, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. In other words, the light of creation, the creator himself came in to his own creation, and they didn't recognize him. <clears throat> but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word, the light, became flesh, became physical, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, 
and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow. So we see here that the light of life with grace and truth came to give us a way of escape. The escape from control of darkness. He paid the price for our sins of rebellion by his death and resurrection. It be, we became born again from the eternal, into the eternal seed of righteousness. We were birthed on, as a new creation of the eternal life through the Savior and the King of glory, Jesus the Christ. The fifth reality is that there is a Savior, Son of God, the source of all creation who came to reconcile, restore, and bring life abundantly to his children or those willing to follow. This fifth reality is escape through Jesus. <laughs> that the Savior, that there is an escape through Jesus Christ. That is a reality. So even when things begin to get messed up again, you can always go to Jesus to escape again. Amen. In First John chapter three, First John chapter three, verse one, still the fifth reality. Escape through Jesus Christ, the Savior. First John chapter 3, verse 1, let's speak. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is what? No sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteousness, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, or of the darkness. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. From this, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In other words, the love of God revealed... In to each and every one of us, he rescued us. Amen. And so there, now there is fellowship. So we see here, that's why Jesus was manifested, was to come and destroy so that that escape could come to each and every human being. Well, this is still a fifth reality, is that there's this escape through Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 9, or 1 Peter chapter 2, sorry. First Peter chapter two. So the Savior that came also revealed his love for God so loved the world. Amen. That he gave his only begotten son. And in this his desire was that the creator would allow children to abide in his presence. And that there be reconciliation and fellowship. But that can only be done through Jesus Christ. Amen. In verse 9, would you read it with me? He says, but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, 
but are now a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Wow. So we see here that we are royal, we are chosen, we are priests, we are ones that proclaim his praise, we are worshipers, which makes us different. We are worshipers of his presence. In John chapter 4, in verse 23. came through the manifestation of the Savior who brought us a way of escape from the powers of darkness, from the grip of deception, and reconciling to the Father as the chosen generation and proclaimers of His praise and His goodness. In John chapter 4, in verse 23, Four twenty-three. Oh, happy days. Eight realities that we must maintain. <clears throat> Let's speak it. Uh, twenty-three and twenty-four. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Man, that's got to be a reality. In other words, when you are worshiping the Father, when you are worshiping the Lord, you are getting God's attention. That must be a reality all the time. You want God's attention? Start worshiping. That's why it's called songs of deliverance. Deliverance from what? The grip of darkness. That is the sixth reality. Father seeks worshipers. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So as you worship the Lord, something begins to happen. His presence comes. In Psalm 16. Psalm 16. In verse 11, <clears throat> true worshipers, the reality of the Father seeks worshipers, that we must become worshipers. What's it say? You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are what? Pleasures forevermore. Praise God. In his presence, so you got in his presence, there's joy. Amen. There's pleasures forevermore. All because of worship. Worship. There's other things I want to share about this too. In Proverbs 29. The reality of seeking the Father as a worshiper. Proverbs 29. He says, if you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. In verse 18, it says, where there's no revelation, the people cast off the restraints of the flesh. But happy is he who keeps the law. In other words, revelation from his presence restrains the flesh from doing what it wants. You have dominion over yourself. It's still under the sixth reality as the Father seeks worshipers. Why? Because he knows that if, if he's seeking you, what's he bringing with him? His presence. Amen? 
in 1 Samuel chapter 10. First Samuel chapter 10. <clears throat> now there was a prophet named Samuel, and Samuel was, the Lord was choosing a, a king for Israel because they refused to accept God as king. They wanted someone tangible they could see. Even the Lord warned them, said, hey, he's going to tax you. He's going to eventually steal from you. He's going to, you know, whatever. He's, man cannot be trusted. So Samuel the prophet sought out Saul, who was called to become king. And he goes over to him, and he anoints him. And he says, uh, he tells him something. He said, you shall go down forward from, in verse 3, from there and come to a terebinth tree of Tabar. There are three men going up to God at Bithel. will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets. That's called gathering. That's why the word says, forsake not gathering. And you shall meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. And they will be what? Prophesying. They will be praising God. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And you will prophesy with them. And you'll be turned into what? Another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do not, that you do as the occasion demands. For God is with you. Now the one that was opportunity, make sure you do it. Became a what? A new man. Do you understand? That's why worship restores your new creation all the time. That's why the Father is seeking those who worship Him. That's why we gather together and worship. Go to Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. Oh, hallelujah. Now in, now in verse 13, Saul, who was rebellious towards God, even though he thought he was doing the right thing, but he wasn't. He disobeyed. And so the Lord said, I'm going to give me another king. In verse 13, And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forth. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. <laughs> In other words, a demon has come upon you. Let our master now, master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. Even they knew that God's presence was the only thing that was going to bring this man freedom. So verse 17, So Saul said to his servants, Provide me a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bithlamite, who is skillful in playing and a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messages, messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, skin of wine, and young goat, and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stay before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was, whenever the Spirit of God, that distressing spirit, was upon Saul, that David would take up a harp. He would play with his hand. 
He would sing. And then Saul would become what? Refreshed. He would become healed. And the demon would what? Leave. He would depart from him. Do you understand the importance of why we constantly worship the Lord? Because the Father seeks and brings his presence to us. That must be a reality for everyone. If it isn't, then they miss. They never reach that freedom place. Amen? Acts chapter 1. You know, when I, in my beginning journey with the Lord, <clears throat> I couldn't get in, a, get in church enough. I don't care what church it was. If I knew that there was high praise and worship, I was there. Boom. And when I was sick and I hurt myself or anything, I would find a place and I would ask the Lord, Lord, where can I worship you? I, I just want to worship you tonight. And he would tell me where to go. And I was plugged into a church. But sometimes there was something that was going on that the worship wasn't going to reach the level that I needed. And he would tell me, go here. And I would go there. I mean, I was brought up in a church for miracles, signs, and wonders. But sometimes there was visitors or whatever. I didn't know what was happening. But I asked the Lord, Lord, because I, would, I, would be, I hurt my back or something physical. Whatever, I need more of your presence because I know in your presence I can get healed. See, I sought his presence to get healed. I didn't seek the doctor. Unless this was necessary. Or afterwards. I would seek the Lord first. Seek ye the kingdom of God and everything will be added to you. You seek the Lord. You seek the Lord. You seek the Lord. Only reason why I went to a doctor is because the Lord said, go to the doctor. So anyways, in this, I, I realized that I, I need your presence. I'm, in, I'm a lover of his presence, and we should be lovers of his presence, knowing that without his presence, we're nothing. And Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, is everybody there? <clears throat> Hallelujah. And it says, but you shall receive what? power when the Holy Spirit, when the presence of the Father has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In other words, you shall be empowered every time. Refreshed and empowered every time. Delivered. But you must seek. You must press over. You must worship. You cannot be just a routine thing. That routine should, that, that discipline area should come to in a, as a routine, but to get in every time. Amen? See, people begin to worship out of the mind instead of the heart, out of the spirit. It says he looks for those who worship him out of truth and spirit. That means out of your spirit, not out of your mind. It's a heart to heart. Is everybody okay? Oh, happy days. Praise God. Now, Psalm 25. Verse 12. 25, 12. How many of you know that if you have more God's presence, there's more fear of the Lord? Amen. There's more reverence, honor, and respect. The more you drift from God's presence, the less honor and respect there is. The more the eyes are on you then. In verse 12 it says, He who, who is the man that fears the Lord, he, sh he shall teach in the what? Ways he should go. He himself shall dwell in what? Prosperity. And his descendants shall what? Inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is those who what? Fear him. Where is the secrets of the Lord? Where is the revelations released from? His presence. 
and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, and he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Anything that the enemy will set and trap. So the seventh revelation, or seventh reality, I'm sorry, is that we must maintain is fear and wait. Fear the Lord and wait on the Lord. Psalm 34. Fear the Lord and wait on the Lord. It's the seventh reality we must maintain. Psalm 34. Verse 8. Psalm 34, verse 8. Is everybody there? O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want or no what? Lack to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Any good thing. So we see this is the fear of the Lord. There's no what? No lack. Amen? Go to Proverbs 9. See, from his presence, everything will come in divine order. The Holy Spirit brings things in divine order. Amen? See, the word tells us that even the fear of the Lord prolongs your days. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Proverbs 9 and verse 10. Let's speak it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which tells you what? What to do. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and your years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you will bear it alone. So we see here that in this, again, the fear of the Lord from God's presence, there's reverence, honor, respect, must be an understanding, or uh, must be a reality to us, that this beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Remember, Wisdom tells us what to do. Understanding tells us how to do it. All from his presence. Isaiah 40. The seventh reality is fear of the Lord and wait on the Lord. Verse 31, <clears throat> Isaiah 40, 31. Is everybody there? Oh, happy days. Let's speak it together. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait on the Lord. Again, the seventh reality is the fear of the Lord and wait on the Lord. And I'm going to close in Leviticus 31. The eighth reality. Leviticus 31. Oh, I say Leviticus 23, I'm sorry. <laughs> Leviticus 23. Leviticus 31. That's a new beginning. <laughs> Leviticus 23 in verse 1. Leviticus 23 verse 1. Let's speak it. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocation. These are my feasts. And he will go through 
in verse 4, and it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. There are seven feasts of the Lord. This is an eighth reality. They must be understood that everything revolves around the feast of the Lord. All events, everything that is biblically set forth from beginning to the end is all connected to the seven feasts of the Lord. And only Jesus Christ can fulfill them. And again, the next feast of the Lord. So we have the seven feasts of the Lord, right? The feast of Passover. Amen. Feast of unleavened, first fruits. Pentecost. Is everybody okay? Feast of trumpets. Feast of atonement. And the feast of tabernacle. The next feast to be fulfilled is the feast of trumpets, which is the removal of the church from the earth. Everything revolves around the feast. Everything connects back to the feast, no matter what, or forward to the feast that Jesus will fulfill. And it says that he will come. And he will call us up. That is the next feast to be fulfilled. I'm telling you, this must be a reality all the time. That the next feast, is that's what he's preparing for. That feast of the removal of the church. I can go on and on about the feast. But we're not teaching about the feast tonight. But that must be a reality to me and you. Amen? So I want to mention these realities one more time to everyone. So you got it. What's the first reality? The, the what? Life in its existence. It must be a reality. The second reality is that there's a source. There's a creator behind all, behind all existence. Amen? What's the third reality? Judgment. Nobody gets away with it. <laughs> What's the fourth reality? The ruler of, that the ruler of darkness. That we're born in darkness that there's a ruler of darkness. Amen? And the fifth reality, that there is a son of God, a creator, or, I mean a, a savior, that, to bring what? Escape from all of this darkness. And the sixth reality, that the Father seeks to worshipers. Amen? And he brings his what? Presence. And the seventh reality is the fear and the weight of the Lord. And the eighth reality is the feast of the Lord. These are realities that we must maintain. Keep, keep them before you. If you keep these, you won't drift. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word and for your warning. In keeping them, there is great reward. And we thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we ask that you search us through, bring conviction, bring reality, bring repentance, bring your presence, bring your truth, bring your healing. And bring your power to your people that we may follow you and obey you and bring glory to your name in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Give somebody a hug. Tell them you did it.